All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, the next seminar. So today, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Stefan Knieck, who is uh, a postdoc at, uh, at Fermilab. Um, so Stefan is here talking to us about the, the bread experiment, which is a new exciting opportunity in, in uh, the world of axions and dark photons. Um, but Stefan initially did his PhD back in, uh, in Munich at the Max Planck Institute, um, where he was one of the, the sort of key people involved in, in uh, on the experimental side in Mad Max, which is now an experiment which is um, uh, continuing. Um, I'm not sure if Stefan, you are in, still involved with Mad Max, but uh, there's some nice overlap between the, the, these uh, the, uh, different topics today. Um, so Stefan, thanks very much for uh, agreeing to give us a seminar so late, uh, your time, and uh, I'll, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much for the introduction. It's um, really a pleasure to give this seminar and um, talk more about bread. Um, so um, yeah, I guess I should get right started. Um, so BRED uh, stands for Broadband Reflector Experiment for Axiom Detection. So before I talk about the Broadband Reflector Experiment, let me talk a bit about Axiom Detection. So um, first of all, why do we want to detect axions? Um, as an experimentalist, I have a very naive picture of a neutron, which is um, shown here on the left. So basically, um, we all know the neutron is comprised of an up quark and two down quarks. And you know that these quarks have charges, right? Um, that's two thirds E or minus one third E. So just by the fact that this neutron is not a fundamental particle, you might expect that this thing has a neutron electric dipole moment. So just by the size of this and these charges, you may estimate that the electric dipole moment of this neutron is something like 10 to the minus 16 um, electron meters. Um, the interesting thing about this is that would violate CP if you would have such a um, dipole moment. So um, yeah, if you do a parity transformation, um, the neutron doesn't stay the same. And if you do a time reversal, it also doesn't stay the same. Um, but that wouldn't really surprise us because we have many particles which don't really um, conserve CP. Now it turns out that if you measure this um, electric dipole moment, um, which people have done for the past 60 years, um, you don't really see any electric dipole moment of the neutron. So this actually shows you the measured electric dipole moment upper limit um, as a function of time. And you see that now at 2020, we are actually at something like 10 to the minus 26 electron centimeter. So that's more than 10 orders of magnitude smaller than what you would expect from this naive estimate. And if you look into the theory, um, you find a term in QCD which actually tells you hmm, there should be an electric dipole moment of the neutron. It's called the theta term in most of the time, and this is because it has this constant theta in front of it, which is an angle. Um, so it can go from minus pi to pi, and it multiplies the gluonic field strength tensor with its dual, and that's not CP conserving. Now, again, from our measurements, we can constrain this term and in particular put constraints on this theta. And it turns out that um, from those measurements of the neutron electric dipole moment, we constrain this theta to be smaller than 10 to the minus 10. Now, this is an angle and there's no reason why this angle should be exactly zero. So having this zero at least to 10 orders of magnitude precise is something surprising. And um, so it motivates at least to say from a theoretical perspective, hmm, maybe there's a mechanism at play that um, naturally drives this theta to zero. And um, such a mechanism was proposed by Petty and Quinn in the 70s. And well, the mechanism is more or less called the axiom. So the idea is um, that this theta could be compensated with a field that can change in space and time. So um, naively, you just replace this theta with this axiom field. And then what happens is that this field can undergo some symmetry breaking and obtain this potential, which is naturally minimized at zero. Now, um, 
the field in the early universe would start out at any value for this uh, theta parameter, but as the universe expands, the field would fall down its potential and um, the inflation would just dilute the energy density of this field. So um, this damps out these oscillations. And in the end, what has remained is just um, coherent oscillations around this minimum, very faint coherent oscillations. They would be much smaller than 10 to the minus 10, but they would be large enough to actually um, make up um, all the cold dark matter that we observe, because this um, field now corresponds to a new massive particle, the axon. So this is why there is actually strong motivation to search for the axion, because the axion solves two problems, the strong CP problem and dark matter. So where do we have to look? Um, this is actually a plot from Kieran that you might already know. Um, so we can, in the axion community, we can do the same thing than um, the other people in the WIMP community who search for like more heavy um, dark matter particles. We can make a plot. On the horizontal axis, we plot the mass of the dark matter particle, in this case, the axon. And on the vertical axis, we plot the coupling of that particle to something we know. And um, for the axon, the most favorite parameter um, is usually the coupling to photons. So you see in this parameter space, there are really already a lot of constraints, but also a lot of white space that's still unexplored. Um, I don't have the time to explain you all these different um, constraints that you see here, um, but something to drive home here really is um, that along this diagonal yellow band, this is where you would expect a QCD axiom. So an axiom which solves the dark matter problem and the strong CP problem. Everything else we usually call axiom-like particle. And um, right in the center, you see ADMX. This is actually an experiment which I'm also involved with. And it's a cavity experiment, which is already sensitive to these sort of QCD axon dark matter particles. So, okay, now um, this is where we want to look, but actually there's um, some more to it. Um, depending on the cosmological scenario, how this axon is produced, we either don't know what this mass is. It could be more or less anywhere along this yellow line. Um, but in a specific scenario, which is called the post-inflationary symmetry breaking scenario, um, where this petty quinn symmetry is broken after inflation, um, there are some predictions where the axon mass would be. And you know, there are many different papers of many different theorists claiming to have a prediction of the mass but they typically lay above um, what all these experiments are able to probe so far. Um, so yeah, this is very rough still, but um, there's huge motivation to push these sort of axion-like particle searches to higher masses. And this is also the motivation why we are doing bread. So how can we search for such axion-like particles? Um, again, the axons are very different than like WIMP dark matter. And one way to see this is by just considering the energy density, which would be in the cold dark matter field and the de Broglie wavelength of axions. Um, if you look at the previous slide, um, you might have noticed that the mass of these axions is extremely tiny. It's at around micro electron volts. Of course, it's a huge range of masses that we want to look at, but let's say for now it's a micro electron volt. Um, then also combining this with the fact that these particles move extremely slowly, it's called dark matter. Um, you can calculate that the de Broglie wavelength of axions is a kilometer. Now, um, if you have a one microelectron volt particle in, in a de Broglie wavelength cube of like one kilometer, and you want to make up 0.4 giga electron volt in a cubic centimeter, you can easily calculate that you need a massive amount of particles to um, make up the dark matter. So what we have here is a really highly degenerate field um, of cold dark matter particles. Um, so essentially, the way to detect this sort of dark matter is looking at this like a classical field, like really a wave which goes through Earth with a wavelength of something like one kilometer. And whatever detector you build, 
it's much smaller than this one kilometer wavelength or depending on the mass maybe becomes comparable to the wavelength but whatever you do you more or less do coherent detection of this axion field um so to make it a bit more theoretical, of course, you can write down the interaction between this axion field and your uh, photon field, which essentially just gives you modified Maxwell's equations. So what the axion does, it gives you source terms to your Maxwell's equations. Um, and one way of looking at this is if I um, provide an external magnetic field, um, essentially what happens here is simply that I get a so-called axion-induced electric field, which is proportional to the external magnetic field and the axion field. Of course, this axion-induced electric field is extremely tiny. Otherwise, we would probably have already seen it. And I need an extremely strong magnet um, to um, turn this um, field on and get it to some level that I can maybe detect it. Um, a nice feature of this is that this field oscillates with the frequency which is given by the axion mass, um, which comes in extremely handy for what people typically do to detect it. So how can we try to detect this axion-induced electric field? Um, to get rid of all the equations, let's draw a picture. Um, we apply a high um, magnetic field. What this high magnetic field is doing it's uh, providing us with this axion induced electric field, which oscillates with the same frequency um, as the axion mass. Um, and so the standard idea of what people are doing to detect it is, well, they put a resonator in the situation. So if you put a high quality factor resonator here, a resonant cavity usually, then um, what happens inside that cavity is that um, the electric field inside that cavity is enhanced by the quality factor of the cavity to a level that you can actually coherently detect it. Um, and you know, since it's oscillating at the frequency of the axion mass after you have um, amplified it with a low noise amplifier, you look at the spectrum and you would expect a peak at the frequency which is given by the axion mass. So this is a very beautiful idea, and this is actually how ADMX works and already successfully excludes QCD axions in its sensitive mass range. But it has a couple of drawbacks. And the major drawback here is that when you want to go to higher masses, um, you lose sensitivity. And why is that? Well, for having a resonant mode inside this cavity, um, more or less you have to fit in the cavity half a photon wavelength. So if you want to go just one order of magnitude higher in mass, it means you um, decrease the volume of the cavity by three orders of magnitude. And what's more, you also have to decrease or typically decrease the quality factor of your resonance. So that together lowers the um, power that you can get out of the cavity by four orders of magnitude. So it's actually very hard to build high mass cavity experiments because of these things. Um, of course, people try anyway, and um, I'm also involved in these efforts, so I know what I'm talking about. Um, so then further you go in mass, essentially what this means, you have to combine multiple smaller cavities. And basically what you get is a photon mode which stretches across all those cavities and you somehow have to combine the signal of all these cavities. Now, at some point, this gets very difficult. And the reason is, um, as you couple more and more cavities or similar things as cavities, let's say, together, the system that you build gets more and more overmoded. So um, you don't only get the mode that couples to the axion, you get many, many other modes that don't couple to the axion. And it's harder and harder to distinguish between um, what couples to the axon and what not, and it gets harder and harder to build a resonator where you are sure that you can control it well enough to detect axions. What's more, it's getting really, really difficult to tune this thing because you, you know you don't only have to adjust the frequency of one cavity, you maybe have to adjust the frequency of 20, 200, 2000 cavities. Um, and you have to make sure um, if you want to combine them coherently that they are all at the same frequency. So this gets really hard. 
So we can be very radical now and say, well, okay, um, it seems like this concept doesn't work anymore at some certain point. What else can we do? Well, the big problem here really seems to be the resonator. So let's be radical. Let's just say, let's get rid of the resonator. And actually, in some, at the high mass limit, um, you can actually calculate that Q equals 1 is the best you can do. Um, so what does that mean, Q equals 1? Well, it essentially means you still have sort of a cavity, but it only consists really out of a single metal wall. You don't have a resonance anymore. And this idea is called a dish antenna. So how does a dish antenna work? A dish antenna is basically still having this high external magnetic field, but now instead of a cavity, just a metal wall. What this would do is your external magnetic field would still induce this axion-induced electric field, um, which is constant in space, just as the axion field, but oscillates with the frequency of the axion mass. Now, in your metal, you have electrons, and they will see this electric field, which is um, induced on the surface of the metal. So they will start moving um, according to this ele axon induced electric field, and they will try to cancel it out. So a metal which has electrons moving on its surface, well, that's an antenna, which is exactly why this is called dish antenna, and an antenna emits electromagnetic radiation. So the idea here is really to detect this emitted electromagnetic radiation from this metallic surface. And yeah, this is exactly the resonator idea, but setting Q to 1. Um, now you could ask, well, if you set Q to 1, isn't the power much too low? And yes, of course, the power gets lower. So you can calculate what the power is. And it's easy to see that this value is smaller than um, what you saw for the cavity. But um, there's this factor of the area of that dish. And at some point when you know you have to make the volume of the cavity and the quality factor so small because of the high mass where you're operating at, this wins because you can just increase the area of the dish and get a larger power. Okay, so this is a nice idea. Now as experimentalists, we have to implement that and we somehow have to detect this radiation. So what these people who proposed this idea first came up with is they proposed to have this metal formed in sort of a half spherical dish form. What this would do is that the photons emitted from that dish um, would be emitted perpendicular to the surface and focused in the center of this dish. Um, this works beautifully in theory, but the drawback is to make that work you need a magnetic field which is parallel to that surface. And it's actually really hard to develop a magnet that has a magnetic field that looks exactly like that. And what's more is, of course, the mag magnet usually is the most expensive part in our experiments. So from an experimental perspective, what you might be tempted to think is, well, Let's start with the magnet and try to design our experiment around the magnet rather the other way around. So a nice magnet to use is a solenoidal magnet. Um, I think every one of us has studied solenoidal magnets at some point um, during their undergraduate. They are nice to calculate. They are basically just a wire um, around the cylinder and give a very homogeneous magnetic field inside their bore. And this is just a small list of multiple solenoidal magnets, which are already out there. They are really widely used in various different applications, and they can actually go to extreme fields and stored energies, like you can just see from this table. So this yellow line, um, which is not even the most crazy magnet here, there are much more crazy ones in the upper rows, that's the ADMX magnet. So you see there's just an enormous potential for these sort of standard solenoidal magnets. Okay, so let's say we want to use a solenoid. Um, how would this look like? How would we do that? So obviously we have to start first with the field that we get from a solenoidal magnet. This is what you can see here. Um, so the field of a solenoidal magnet, um, as I said before, is very homogeneous in its bore and it's parallel to the cylinder. 
So how can we use this with addition tendon? Well, obviously we could just put a metallic cylinder in this magnetic field. And then what happens is that the walls of the cylinder, they will start emitting photons. Now, obviously these photons are not really focused anywhere. And what we really want is we want to put a sensor or an antenna of some kind at some position um, and focus all our radiation at that point. So how could we do this? Well, we could develop some optics that does exactly this. And that's really the hallmark idea of bread is um, this reflecting surface, which is a parabolic um, surface, which is instead revolving about its um, vertex axis, it's revolved around the axis of the cylinder. So it has this peaked structure in the middle, but the focusing properties it has, it's basically reflecting the photons which are emitted from the cylinder, it's reflecting them back um, to back to the cylinder wall and then back from the cylinder to the focal spot. Um, this has a nice aspect ratio of one to two times square root of two, which actually fits nicely in most solenoidal magnets. So um, this sort of design idea is actually not um, completely new. Uh, similar designs have been around since the 19th century um, when people wanted to do sort of the opposite. Um, you have a um, light source, which is a point source. And what you want is a very uh, more or less collimated uh, light beam. Um, you can actually do more or less the inverse. So uh, 19th century lighthouse mirrors looked actually quite similar. Um, okay, so that's the design, how we can do our optics. Now, um, the final step is really um, to come up with something that can detect this thing, these photons that arrive there. And there are different um, techniques to detect photons. What we as physicists working on ADMX and cavity experiments are very familiar with are um, um, heterodyne detection methods. The nice thing about heterodyne detection is you detect the amplitude and the phase of an incoming electromagnetic wave. So you can have very high frequency resolution, which is nice for the axon because it's just a very narrow line. But the drawback is really it's quantum limited, at least in its uh, basic version. So as you go up in axon mass, and meaning in frequency for your resonator or also for the dish antenna, the noise that you couple into the system just goes up proportionally, the quantum limited noise. And there are various ways to try to evade this. Um, one way is use a bolometer. So what, I, what you're doing here is basically you have some sort of absorber. A photon comes in, you absorb the photon, and all you do is you measure the power that has been deposited in the absorber. So you lose all the phase information, but you are not interested in any phase information. You really just want to know how much power is arriving at the absorber. Um, so that can get you below the quantum limit. Um, and something else, of course, what you can try to do is you can try to actually count um, individual photons that arrive here with various techniques. One technique is using um, um, an SNSPD, and I will talk about this uh, later on in more detail. So these different receiver types, they scale conceptually differently in um, in their sensitivities. So that's exactly the same plot um, as I showed before, just a little bit more zoomed in version. So here you have all the cavity experiments, here the yellow band with the axon models, and sort of these lines, they show you how these different um, detector types, how their sensitivities scale with, um, with axon mass. And um, I think something nice here is um, the, actually for a dish antenna of a given size, the emitted power is constant along this, um, this axion model band. So if you just follow along this band, the power is constant. And that's why the bolometer sensitivity is actually parallel to this band as well, because the bolometer really just cares about the power that's deposited. Um, of course, not so for the standard quantum limit with heterodyne detection, because as you go to higher um, frequencies, 
you get your quantum limit goes up, so your sensitivity goes down, and you di directly see that it's very hard to go um, with heterodyne detection to like higher masses because um, of the standard quantum limit. Um, however, if you really count photons, then of course um, you have to count more photons at higher masses, so you have a similar issue than the quantum limit. But it's not as as harsh because it just goes with the square root of the number of photons. And if you can count a photon per day, actually you can achieve really nice sensitivities. Of course, this is just conceptually to show you how you know different technologies behave. Um, we have to look into like concrete detectors that we can use. So we did a wide um, literature research of different terahertz sensor sensors that are out there and actually contacted different groups. Um, to take part in BRAD, because like from the ADMX side, we are not any experts about photometers or single photon counters. So what we came up in the end is um, this table, which summarizes different photometers and single photon counters that people are studying or that are already out there. So this Gentech and IR labs are actually uh, commercial products. Um, the KIT and TES, the QCDs and SNSPDs, those are things that are under active research. Um, I don't go through all these parameters in this table, but maybe say um, just what is important for us is, of course, um, which bandwidth these detectors have. So, of course, we want them as broadband as possible because that's the advantage of the dish antenna. What's the noise they give us or the dark count rate for the single photon counters? And um, what you will see later on, uh, why this is so important, also what's the sensor size. Um, so we want the whole light to be focused on the sensor. So if the sensor is too small, um, this is also a drawback of the sensor. But putting all this together, we can actually uh, derive some more realistic sensitivities for different uh, future setups. Um, for the details of all this, I refer us refer you to um, this PRL paper that got recently accepted, which details the concept of bread. Um, but essentially, the message that this should send is um, with these sensors, um, you can really probe a broad mass range um, of the axion, but also uh, the hidden photon, which interacts similar than the axion with photons. And um, with some research effort in the future, you will be actually able to probe into these um, QCD axon model bands that I've been talking about. Um, so one thing that we are actively pursuing is um, putting this setup besides ADMX EFR. So ADMX EFR is actually an array of 18 cavities for a little bit higher masses than ADMX is sensitive right now. And it will be housed in a new magnet at Fermilab in a couple of years from now. So this is something that will definitely come along or almost definitely come along. And the idea here is that this will have space to house other experiments beside it and to do R&D on those experiments. And um, it's connected to millikelvin fridges, so we can actually cool down things to extremely cold temperatures. And it would have space, for example, for um, for bread experiment as well. So we could operate this at almost 10 Tesla um, in a large magnet board just besides ADMX and would have an area of four square meter, which brings us close to some of the limits I actually showed on the previous slide. So that's the vision. How do we get there? And uh, now really the fun part of the presentation comes, I think. Um, like the first prototypes that we already um, have at hand. So, and what I would like to start is really um, the heart of, of all this before discussing any particular frequency um, solutions that we are looking at. Um, what we need for any sort of pilot experiment is we need this inner reflector, which is really the speciality of bread. Um, so what we did over the past um, year is we actually started to um, by these parts. So this is just the upper part of the inner reflector, which we recently got and we started to characterize. And this is really important because obviously we want to know the optical properties of this reflector and whether they are sufficient for what we want to do. Um, 
So there are different methods how you can actually characterize this. Um, and um, it's also something we are learning and it's extremely fun. So the first thing um, that we are doing is we actually directly try to test um, the optical properties of these reflectors. And this is what you might have seen um, while you were waiting for this uh, session to start. Um, we can reflect test patterns of these um, reflectors. And this is what you see here on the left. So um, for example, on this part here that we got, um, if you reflect radial lines, you see that uh, the reflection is very sharp on that surface. But if you uh, reflect concentric lines, you actually see that they get blurred out on the surface. So the optical properties of this part um, asimuthally are very good, but vertically they are a li little bit less good. Um, still good enough to be used in some of our experiments. Um, we can confirm this um, with other methods. So one very obvious thing to test the optical properties is just reflect the laser beam, as you can see here. And um, you can directly see that actually there are horizontal machining parts on that um, upper reflector piece that um, we had manufactured. Um, so that's consistent with, with what we have seen on the previous slide. And um, then we can go ahead and directly try to measure this. So what you see here on the left is um, a coordinate measuring machine. And this has a little ball on top here, which it moves along the surface. And um, you know, whenever this red LED turns on and off, it measures the point. So it really presses that ball against the surface and it can measure positions with micrometer accuracy. And what these plots show is basically the result. So if we go horizontally along that part, we see deviations from you know, what we would expect um, at the five micron level. But when we go vertically, we see deviations that are more at the 50 micron level, so 10 times larger, um, plus some uh, systematic deviation um, that's on the part as well. Um, so this again, it shows you that the part is good horizontally and uh, 10 times worse um, vertically. But still, you know, this is 50 micrometers for an experiment where you're talking about a wavelength at the centimeter level, this will be definitely still good enough. So talking about experiments um, at the cent centimeter level, um, of course, with this, we now want to build an experiment. So one pilot experiment that we want to build is called Giga Bread. Um, it's, an, it's a version of bread in the um, like tens of gigahertz region. And at these frequencies, really the axon field and also the hidden photon field would be completely coherent over this reflector piece. So what would happen is um, that you have a coherent emission of electromagnetic waves from the outer walls, which get focused onto this focal point. And the wavelength is actually still not so crazy that you, um, you can actually do COMSO simulations of this. So you can do a full wave simulation of um, such a setup, um, at least assuming a smooth symmetry. And if you do that, um, this is sort of the result you get from such a simulation. You can actually simulate um, the coherent fields which get generated at the focal spot. Um, so you see it has this um, specific um, shape where the electric field points outwards from the center. Uh, this is very different from you know, what standard horn antennas would have to pick up, where usually the field is maximum in the center. So the question is, of course, how, do we, how can we pick this up? Um, how do we pick up a signal which doesn't come straight onto the horn, but from its sides? And the solution to that problem is um, using um, a coaxial horn antenna. So a coaxial horn antenna has a conductor in its center, unlike you know, a conventional horn antenna, which doesn't have such a conductor in the center. And what this does is um, it just essentially behaves like a coax transmission line up until this point. But then when the wave couples to free space, um, it actually has a far field pattern, which looks like what you see on the bottom here, which looks actually to the left and to the right and not just straight to the front. And um, so this far field pattern is more or less the Fourier transform of the near field pattern I just showed you on the previous slide. 
So by designing our antenna to this far field pattern, we match um, the antenna to the near fields which get generated here on the focus board. Um, so we did quite a lot of design work for this, this horn, also in conjunction with the reflector, of course. Um, so something um, nice to point out here is that we can move this horn in and out of the focal spot. And when we move it out of the focal spot, um, we don't have any sensitivity to axioms. So this is a way to, um, to check whether um, a signal that we have is actually an axion or not, because um, when we see something, we can move the horn out of the focal spot and see if the signal is available. Um, you see also these ripples in here. So the horizontal axis is frequency. The vertical axis is um, the position with respect to the focal spot. These ripples are actually residual standing waves between the horn and the outer uh, cylinder vaults. And um, they are not um, bad. They actually help us because they, they help us to calibrate um, the reflector. So something we can do is we can try to directly see these um, waves in standing waves in a measurement by injecting a signal. And if we inject a signal, we would expect to see the same pattern. We can actually move the antenna out and into the focal spot, reflect the beam. And when we move it out of the focal spot, um, we would expect the radiation not to come back to the antenna. So we would see um, a bad reflection coefficient. But when we move it into the focal spot, again, we see that we get a huge reflection back to the horn. So like this, we will be able to characterize whether the, the horn in conjunction with the reflector works as we expect. So we actually um, already acquired um, such horns. So these are some pictures of this horn. Um, here you can see um, the inside is actually very highly um, polished. And um, also, this is the inner conductor. Um, you, if, you, if you just look at it, you can see your own face in it. And um, this is the connector that connects it to an actual line. And in front, we have a um, dielectric support to hold all this together. Um, this is carefully designed to not change the RF properties of the whole system too much. And yeah, so these are more or less the overall dimensions of this. Um, we did an extensive testing campaign of this. So this is the test setup that we devised to test these horns. Um, essentially, what you are doing is what you can see here on the right. Um, you basically put two of these horns in front of each other. And then you have them at the same angle with respect to the central axis. Um, so the idea is to actually measure this far field pattern, um, which more or less is the Fourier transform of that near field pattern that we've been talking about, and to confirm that they are able to pick up this signal that we wanted to pick up. So what we can do is we can rotate those antennas around this axis. Um, to give you a better um, feel of scale, this is our graduate student, Gabe, um, who's been very productive on this. Um, sitting in this RF shielded room with all these absorbers around to make sure the antennas really just see the signal from each other. So the two antennas are sitting in front of each other here. And um, so this is um, just a little nice video of um, how this relative movement looks like. So you can see um, we have two of these horns and they move um, to the same angle with respect to each other. Um, the actual measurement takes much longer than um, what you see in this video, but um, um, I think it, it nicely illustrates how you know um, the measurement procedure goes. So this is how we do it. What is the result of um, when we do it? So these are the far field patterns that we actually measure. So blue is simulated, orange is measured. Um, it's hard to make the match exactly. But you know, um, you basically see that the orange curve um, more or less follows the blue curve. And um, if you calculate the matching between the two, you find that in terms of the power that our horn will pick up compared to the simulated horn, that they differ maybe by a couple of percent at most. And as you go to higher frequencies, actually the match gets better and better. So this is now at 15 gigahertz. 
So um, we are confident that we um, understand the RF properties of these horns and that we will be able to use them um, in a gigabread experiment. Um, of course, the horns are not the only thing that you have to worry about. Um, we want to pick up the signal that arrives at the focal spot with, with a large bandwidth. So we have to devise a data acquisition chain which can handle a large bandwidth. And what that in, means is, well, you put a large bandwidth amplifier, um, low noise amplifier there, which um, is not a big problem. Um, you do down conversion to a band which is from zero to whatever bandwidth you want. In our case, we want to have a four gigahertz bandwidth. Um, the challenge comes in when you want to sample this signal. So usually um, what people do is they sample signals of a megahertz bandwidth or 50 megahertz or maybe 100 megahertz. We want four gigahertz um, to really see uh, the broadband response of this um, reflector and to be able to probe all the frequencies within that four gigahertz bandwidth at the same time. And the, the challenge here is um, Nyquist just tells you that you have to sample this signal at twice the bandwidth that you want to have, because um, if your maximum frequency is 4 gigahertz, you need to sample it with 8 gigahertz, otherwise you won't see the oscillations, obviously. So what this means, if each of these points generates a byte of data, you are generating 8 gigabytes every second. So the challenge here is really to devise a system that can reduce these eight gigabytes in real time. So you not have to save eight gigabytes of data onto a hard drive and um, which is, yeah, basically we can't do. So how do we do that? Um, first of all, um, we use an FPGA board to do that. Um, and on this FPGA board, we can implement a polyphase filter bank. And all this is doing, it's parallelizing that process um, um, that's doing the FFT of the spectra. So it's uh, splitting the spectrum up in 16 subspectra, which are only like 500 megahertz in bandwidth. And then it's, um, the, it's doing the Fourier transform of each of those spectra individually. Like this, you can do the FFT of these spectra in real time. That doesn't solve your problem with the eight gigabytes per second yet. For that, you need a second step, which is you have to average down your data in real time. Um, of course, we get eight gigabytes per second, but we don't need to save all these eight gigabytes. All we care about is like tiny signals above the noise. So what we mainly see is the noise. And what we actually want to do is we want to average the noise out and in the end only see the signal. So the idea is to do um, for a time of each one second, um, sum up all the FFTs that we get on the board and then transfer it to an outside computer and only save uh, average spectra every second, every 30 seconds, depending on, on how you will configure it in the end. So we actually did already quite a lot of simulations to make sure, you know, the memory capabilities of this FPGA board are sufficient such that we can do this. And um, uh, what's really the name of the game here is how many bits you want to retain um, from the data that's coming from the FFTs. So you don't run into quantization errors, but on the other hand, don't overwhelm the memory of the FPGA. Um, so that's on its way and it's um, the FFTs are already and the polyphase filter bank is already implemented and the average is to come in the next couple of weeks actually. So when we put all this together, this is what we expect in terms of sensitivity um, to these hidden photons. So again, this is the same plot as I introduced you at the beginning, now just for a different sort of particle, the hidden photon. For the hidden photon, you have the advantage that you don't need the external magnetic field, but other than that, it interacts exactly in the same way. And you see if we have this four gigahertz bandwidth and just do a single day measurement at room temperature with the system that we are designing right now, we easily um, should be able to get competitive limits in this parameter space. And if we do a one year measurement and split it up in three different bandwidths, um, that we scan over four 
months each, we would be able to even improve this further. To compare this to sort of the bandwidth that all the um, sort of cavity experiments have obtained earlier, it might not be as sensitive, but it's much more broadband in terms of the masses that you've killed. Um, we are in contact um, with collaborators at Argon. They have this four Tesla MRI magnet there. And we think that um, our setup will fit in there. So um, we are actually planning now to also put it in there um, after we would have a successful run um, without a magnet. And then again, a one day measurement would almost bring you close to the limits that already have been set by CAST. And if you do this thing for measuring for one year, um, you would actually be able to beat it. Um, if you think further ahead, and instead of this magnet, use the ADMX EFR magnet that I've been showing a couple of slides ago, and also cool this thing down. So you bring the noise temperature down by two orders of magnitude, um, you will be able to significantly dip in this parameter space with a setup like this. So yeah, this is um, our GigaBread pilot, um, but we don't only want to do this um, at uh, frequencies where we would do heterodyne detection. As I said at the beginning, the real goal is to extend this to higher frequencies where really the cavity is completely untenable. Um, and here at these at even higher frequencies, let's say infrared frequencies, um, you have completely different challenges. So let's say we are at infrared frequencies. That also means that the axion, um, the Broglie wavelengths get smaller. It gets comparable or actually slightly smaller than your experiment. And one way of um, looking at this is considering explicitly the velocity of the axion dark matter. So we know the velocity distribution um, of dark matter particles around us. And we know that they are basically moving with a speed which is around um, 10 to the minus 3 times the speed of light. Um, what this means for dish antenna is um, we have to conserve momentum and we have to conserve energy. And um, the energy of the dark matter mainly resides in the mass of the dark matter particle, but the energy of the photon mainly resi only resides in the momentum of the photon. And on the other hand, we have to conserve the parallel momentum to the dish which tells you in the end that um, the um, outgoing angle of the photon is given by the parallel velocity of the dark matter particle in units of the speed of light. So if this is 10 to the minus three, like we expect it to be, then this is a milliradian. So in other words, if um, your detector is about a meter away from your dish, that means if you have an electromagnetic wave with a wavelength that's um, on the nanometer or micrometer level, you will have a focal spot which is displaced by one millimeter from its ideal position, which is much larger than the wavelength, of course. So if you have a small detector, which is much smaller than a millimeter, this can be really an issue. So we have to be really careful about this. And we did um, careful analysis of this for bread. So what this shows you is, assuming a velocity of dark matter particles in that direction along the direction of the axis of the barrel and you know different um, rays of photons emitted for different axon velocities and how they get displaced on the focal spot this is of course hugely exaggerated but we can simulate for a realistic dark matter velocity distribution how would be the intensity distribution um, of photons arriving at the focal spot um, as a function of the radius on the detector. And um, what you can see from this is basically that within a diameter of a millimeter for our 20 centimeter um, pilot experiments, um, we will collect um, the majority of all the photons. Interesting um, enough, um, the naive spherical dish um, which other experiments are actually using um, to do hidden photon searches has slightly um, worse um, focusing, pro yeah. <laughs> focusing properties. 
Okay, so this is one important bit to make sure that your sensor is large enough to detect the majority of the radiation focused on the focal spot. The other thing is to make sure that the surface properties are good enough. I introduced you all these measurements at the beginning, um, how we characterized our part. And um, this is essentially why we do this so carefully, because um, if you have some surface perturbation, of course, this is hugely exaggerated here. Um, but um, depending on how large the surface perturbation is, you blur up your uh, focal spot. So by the, just the requirement to not make it larger than this one millimeter, you can set constraints on different surface perturbation waves that you can assume on the part, how big they can become. And essentially, this just tells you again that any angular deviation they set on the surface has to be less than this one milliradian that you anyway get from the velocity effects. So then shorter the wavelength of these perturbations gets, then uh, smaller you have to have the amplitude to not get above this one milliradian. Um, and so basically, if you have any surface perturbations over length scales of centimeters, um, they already have to be at a level smaller than a micrometer. Um, and that tells us that we need to go to a relatively fancy uh, manufacturing methods for these inner reflectors to do it at optical frequencies like telescope optics. And um, we are in contact with various diamond turning shops to have this uh, part manufactured by diamond turning. Um, the other thing to build an experiment at the infrared frequencies is, of course, the detector. And um, unlike a horn at the gigahertz frequencies, um, what we are envisioning for infrared is using an SNSPD. So this is actually an SNSPD that we are already testing at Fermilab. It has a 15 times 15 uh, micrometer area. And the way an SNSPD works is actually uh, relatively simple. This is um, an, um, an array of wires, uh, nanowires. Um, that are superconducting. And if you have a photon at infrared frequencies impinging on those wires, um, they break the superconductivity of these cables locally. So if you run a current through those wires, um, it will go through those wires as long as they are superconducting. But when a photon comes, um, the photon blocks um, the, uh, the path that the current can go, and it will go wherever else um, it feels to lower resistance. So if you bias it with a current and connect this bias wire bias T to, an, um, to a scope, you can see a pulse on the scope when you have a photon impinging. Um, so this is what we want to do at infrared frequencies. And for us, it's of course very important that this technology works at the wide range of incident angles, which um, we are studying at MIT with um, rigorous coupled wave analysis. And preliminary results um, seem to indicate that, um, you know, with relatively standard SNSPD designs, you can achieve a wide acceptance um, angle. So what this shows is absorption against wavelength, and the different colors are different angles, and you see that the difference is not extremely huge, actually. Um, we are also testing them at Fermilab. So this is just, again, how we mount them in Fermilab. And we have this nice ADR uh, refrigerator, and we will be able to inject laser beams to do actually measurements also at different incident angles. Um, we can measure the superconducting properties of these devices already, and we actually already see first dark count pulses, which is nice. Um, in the end, we want to use this uh, 400 times 400 micrometer device, which is already out there, um, which our collaborators have developed. Um, the goal will be to um, manufacture it in an array for two times two such. So the diameter will be close to a millimeter, just what I just told you we need. And if you can do that, and you will get a dark count rate, which is actually as low as a photon per day, then this is sort of the hidden photon sensitivity that you would be able to achieve. Um, so this green and the blue line is um, the previous um, limits that people have set from like um, the, the xenon um, 
xenon results looking at the sun and you see that you can be better like um, one or two orders of magnitude compared to those so this will be uh, nice as well so yeah those are our pilot experiments and um, at this point i should um, say a huge thank you to the whole collaboration so over the past year um, we had this um, collaboration growing and growing and particular more and more students which um, were extremely helpful to build up all these uh, little experiments that I've been just showing you. And um, yeah, at this point, I hope I could introduce a bit the motivation why we want to do this and the plans we have for the mid to long term for this and sort of the first experimental advances that we um, achieved. Thank you very much, and I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. That was really fascinating uh, for me. Um, does anyone have any uh, questions they'd like to ask? Yeah, there's a hand up. Yeah, hi. Hi, Stefan. Mike Tober here. How are you going? Oh, hi, Mike. <laughs> um, looking at your your uh, experiment um, and some of the um, calculations you're putting up it this does seem to be it does seem to have some uh, depending on the size you make it some q factor and not uh, 100 percent for broadband um, I would imagine um, and it's not it's not that clear to me and also there should be a volume effect Oh, you've got area, so it's it's. I I was trying to distinguish how all these things go with frequency as you go up in frequency. Uh, it was I, I'm still not a hundred percent clear because it so, must. If you want a low frequency, it must be bigger than if you want a high frequency. Put it that way. Yeah. Well, the the nice thing about this really is um, that the power that the dish is emitting is constant as you go along this um, QCD axiom band. So um, it, it doesn't really depend much on frequency. Of course, you get more, like the, the surface gets uh, larger or smaller in units of the wavelength. But what you're really emitting is something like a plane wave from that surface. And this like focusing optic transforms this plane wave mode into the mode of the antenna that you put at the focal spot. Um, of course, at some point, there's a lower frequency cutoff where this doesn't work anymore when the surface gets like comparable to the photon wavelength. So um, there you have to be careful, but um, we are far away from that limit. There should be a higher frequency cutoff as well. Well, the, yeah. uh, the higher frequency cutoff in a way is um, when the but there's not really a cutoff it's just at some point the axion wavelength this the Broglie wavelength becomes comparable or smaller than the barrel size so what then happens is the axion photon conversion happens incoherently on that surface um, so you get photons which incoherently get emit from emitted from the surface at slightly different angles according to the velocity distribution so you get a focal um, spot distribution of photons, which is incoherent and blurred out by um, whatever the uh, velocity distribution tells you. Um, and then, you know, then um, if you think in this in terms of modes, like we like in ADMX or other experiments, then you really have to be sensitive to all these different modes arriving at the focal spot, which is a variety of modes. So you get you get some sensitivity hit um, if yeah, from that, but that's all taken into account in our calculations. Okay, cheers. Were, were any of the, the um, projections that you showed, um, like taking into account these uh, finite velocity effects, or were you chosen? Did you choose your bandwidth so that you didn't have to to worry about that? For example, with this gigabread uh, projection. Um, so for gigabread in particular, you don't need to worry much about these velocity effects. Um, so for gigabread, again, um, the, the spot 
due to velocity effects would be displaced by um, less than a millimeter, but our horn itself, it's, it's already uh, four centimeter in diameter. So um, yeah, there is some small effect probably, but it's negligible because essentially the, um, the radiation just comes coherently from uh, the complete barrel and it's really a perfect plane wave in the sense at these frequencies. Mm -hmm. Um, at around 100, 200 gigahertz, when we are at like the transition to terahertz, um, there you have to be really careful because that's like the intermediate range between where it's coherent and incoherent. Um, so, um, but you still can handle it. Um, Avada? Uh, hello, can you go back to page 45, please? 45. Because uh, I was a bit confused on the plug for that. 45. Oh, 45. This one? Yeah, because um, from my understanding is that the diagonal band is like the QCD axion yes. band. So is it is GigaBread not um, able to detect any QCD axions at this current stage? Um. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have put it like this. So the, the goal for Gigabred, at least at this stage, is not to make it actually sensitive to this band. Um, this would be still a smaller version of bread um, itself. Um, it's not the, um, it's just a four square meter area. And actually at these frequencies to go down to this band, you have to go to millikelvin and you have to go to single photon counters. You can't do it with heterodyne detection. Okay. So um, I think at these frequencies, yeah, other experiments um, will maybe eventually be more sensitive than than uh, bread. Okay. But it's bread is a nice test bed for us because we know how to do heterodyne detection. Okay. But like I said, in the end, we want to go to higher frequencies. Yeah, so it's detecting like maybe possibly other axion-like particles, but not QCD axions. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Could you, I mean, could you make it bigger or are you limited on the size of the bank there, I guess? Um, well, yeah, if you have a, an infinitely large uh, magnet, you can make it bigger. <laughs> so. Um, Put it in CMS. <laughs> for example, yeah, I think uh, DM Radio already wants to do that, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but uh, that's not to say that, um, of course, um, we, in the long term, we want to, um, let me just put this up. Um, in the long term, of course, we want to make at some point experiments that are sensitive to um, the QCD axiom band just um, at the higher frequencies. Yeah. Um, where it's actually more feasible with the single photon mm -hmm. detectors or the, um, um, the volumeters to go there. Um, does anyone have any other questions? I could I could keep going for for a while, but I'll let anyone else go if they want. Uh, I don't see anyone raising their hand. Maybe I can ask one thing. I um, I'm still not clear, clear on is the uh, noise. For example, with Gigabread, um, mm -hmm. do you expect to see any lines? For example, that might look like the axon, and if you're looking over a year for those projections, how do you interrogate those potential candidates? Um, yeah, this is a very good question. So um, in principle, we have a lot of ways to distinguish between axion-like lines and lines that would uh, come from other sources. So in these sort of experiments, you always see other lines, even if you go to an RF shielded room, which we will do. Um, but you will, because it's so extremely sensitive, at some point you will see um, radio signals just coupling out from the outside, maybe your phone signal, um, all these kind of things. They typically have a different line shape than what you would expect from the axon. So this is one thing to distinguish it. Um, another thing to distinguish it is um, actually, um, actually this, right? So one thing is moving the antenna to the off focal position. Of course, this effectively introduces some dead time. 
But what we will do in practice is we'll just move this horn uh, slightly up and down during data taking. And so we can correlate the position of the horn over time um, with the signal that we are integrating. And these resonances, they have the nice future that they also move as we move the antenna up and down because the distance between that antenna and the, um, and the barrel changes slightly. So whatever signal we have, it would be modulated by this um, little movement of the antenna, but we wouldn't completely lose the signal. So we could um, search, we could test this modulation and get, get rid of uh, background signals um, by just subtracting everything that doesn't modulate. Um, and of course, finally, um, the, the last resort is always turn off the magnet and repeat the experiment. But um, that's very, very expensive in a sense. Yeah. <laughs> I think Mike, do you have another question or? Yeah, yeah. Um, so you're assuming that the axion fields are created from the cylindrical boundary, is it? Um, actually, so what this simulation is doing, it's having this um, um, axion induced current, which is in the Maxwell's equations in the whole um, volume. So this simulates the uh, full axion modified Maxwell's equations. And what you get is, of course, you get also mod, um, a contribution from this inner reflector. Um, just this contribution is not focused at the focal spot and it doesn't uh, interfere destructively with the signal. Yeah, and the, the, top, the top surface is completely open, right? Um, yeah, so actually what we do here is we put absorbers there. And this doesn't hurt us much because we don't want to build a resonant experiment, so absorbers are okay. But what about um, what about thermal noise? Do you model that, or do you know what that? Um, yeah. So I mean, in, in the worst case, we just see um, we see the temperature of the whole reflector. So you just say this is a black body um, at that temperature. Um, so actually, at the frequencies where the horn is matched um, better, we would expect to see less um, less thermal noise because we just look at the, at the mirrors and the horn looks at itself. So we see the uh, noise of the, um, of the amplifiers, which for our room temperature experiment will be around 100 uh, Kelvin. And um, at the frequencies where it's matched a bit, bit worse, we see a bit of the absorbers. So we see something more close to 300 Kelvin. But in our sensitivity projections, I actually assumed 500 Kelvin just to be conservative. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, I don't think it will be much worse than that. No worries. Pardon? I think that's it. Um, okay. <laughs> um, if anyone has any final questions, then please shout out. Um, but uh, if not, I think we can uh, thank Stefan again for that um, really fascinating talk. Um, really um brilliantly described uh and uh and we can close um there so i'll stop recording <laughs>